can just kind of chat afterwards if questions come up um, or if you know there's kind of a, a curbside case type question. Um, be looking forward to talking with you all about that. Um, so uh, the objectives today are to summarize key findings of reporting from the national opioid overdose epidemic and describe how they inform our clinical um, practice. We'll list the recommended treatment options and other treatment modalities that are part of um, MAT, which is also um, otherwise known as MOUD, which is um, kind of putting medication at the centerpiece instead of medication-assisted treatment. Um, medication for opioid use disorder is another way that we'll um, frame that. And identify the barriers to treating opioid use disorder, or OUD, in our personal clinical practice. And so. I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology um, of this epidemic. Um, so this slide is looking at, this is probably a slide you've seen before, um, it's um, looking at the three waves of the opioid overdose deaths. And what you see here is basically this first wave um, starting, you know, um, at the turn of the century um, was where we see this rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths, right? But then really in 2010 is when that started to level off um, due to increase um, uh, regulations on that, but you do start to see a rise, subsequent rise really in heroin overdose deaths, right? When people were um, often turning to that um, uh, due to um, less of the pain prescriptions or um, the cost. Um, and then here in 2013 is where you see this gradual increase and it really goes, goes up steeply in 2015, but this third wave is the rise in the synthetic opioid overdose deaths. And these are synthetic opioids um, other than um, methadone, so looking um, to namely at fentanyl, but also tramadol. So what we see is that the number of drug overdose deaths decreased by 4% between 2017 and 2018, but the number of overdose deaths was still four times higher in 2018 than back at that turn of the century. Um, so nearly 70% of uh, deaths in the 67,000 deaths in 2018 involved an opioid. And we also see these significant changes in the opioid involved death rates. So um, while they decreased by 2%, we see the prescription opioid death rates decrease by 13%. Um, heroin death rates decreased by 4%, but then again, what we were seeing in that slide is that increase in the synthetic death rates, excluding methadone, increasing by 10%. So New Mexico data, these are the, um, the most common drugs that are causing unintentional overdose deaths. So there's the prescription opioids at the top, um, but then not far behind are heroin. Methamphetamine has seen a significant rise across the country, but um, certainly here, um, benzodiazepine, um, that should say, at 23% uh, and cocaine. So this is kind of a busy slide, but it's looking again at New Mexico from 2012 to 2018. Um, here um, you see the deaths per 100,000 population. And you know, here are our um, non-fentanyl prescription um, opioids. Here's our rise, um, what I was saying there in the methamphetamine. Here you have heroin, and here you have that steady rise um, in, in fentanyl. Again, this is looking at opioid overdose, this time related to emergency department visits. Um, and this has really gone up, I'll say, to uh, there's a sort of corresponding graph for methamphetamine. Um, but these are the opioid overdoses, again, increasing there and then just a slight decrease in recent years. So what are the, we'll talk about the adverse outcomes that are associated with opioid um, dependence, opioid use disorder. So. What we see are med medical risks, right? I think everyone, especially practicing in New Mexico, is well aware of the risk of hepatitis C. Um, people who um, inject drugs um, have a 70% prevalence that increases over time. So it's 65% after um, using injection drugs for the first year, but then we see it go up to about at least 85% at five years of use. Um, also HIV, and this is national data, I, I think it's um, somewhat less here um, represents 25% uh, injection drug use represents 25% of new HIV infections. What about the mortality risk? So there's some stunning numbers here from studies that have been done um, over time. Um, and what we see this overdose risk of a one and a half percent per year, but over time, uh, 24 year study showing um, over a quarter of the population deceased and 30 year study in California showing um, nearly 50%. Um, this 
annual risk of dying for someone who is um, using heroin is increased 20 times compared to someone who's not using. And also this mortality rate is um, 63 times higher for, for, for not being in treatment. Um, and we'll talk about this. This is really the key take home in many ways. Um, you can see the major causes of death with drug overdose being the, the number one cause um, for uh, accidental death in the US. And then there's many psychosocial risks, right? So low employment rates. Um, you think about um, if you're using something that's very short acting, you're going to withdraw. So heroin's usually dosed every six hours. Um, it's hard to, to, to keep a steady, steady job, the time that goes into recovering um, from using as well. Um, but then people need money to buy, um, to, to purchase the, 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 the supply. And so that oftentimes will turn to crime. Um, you can see um, these uh, follow-up 10-year studies showed at least about 20% incarceration rate. And then there's of course, large medical costs. So we'll turn to talking about treatment and certain considerations for that, which is really the reason why we're, we're, we're here doing this, this echo. So really what we see is that um, perspectives have changed over time, right? So um, back on the war, the war on drugs, right? Um, you all remember, remember that um, when addiction, and, and this is really, the, this thought process has flowed through in many ways to some current thinking. And so we need to be aware of that. Um, but when addiction is really seen as a crime, so um, it shows about, um, you know, the, the, you can think back to the temperance movements, but also, the, as I said, the war on drugs. And then kind of thinking of addiction as a moral problem or a failing. So this person doesn't have a strong enough character to avoid using. And then we um, come to the perspective of addiction as a chronic disease, um, which we know um, that every disease is going to have kind of a chronic relapsing remitting course and addiction is one of them. Um, and it's really a complex multifaceted condition. We'll look at that a little closer um, where we see that addiction has these various um, aspects, psychological, physiological, social, and environmental contributors that all um, are part of its um, presentation. So looking at that a little bit more, again, we have the biological aspect where we're actually having drugs affecting chemistry of the brain and also, um, especially in, in younger brains and adolescents really, um, you know, really um, causing a lot of effect on sort of those formative pathways in the brain. And then the psychological aspect of it is where the, the altered brain chemistry can really affect someone's ability to think what they're feeling and their perception and behavior sort of affecting their executive um, function too. And then the sociological aspect. So this of course is um, in many um, chronic diseases that we see oftentimes one of the main factors and sometimes the hardest for us as clinicians to really work with, um, but really underlie a lot of the person's um, experience. So all the interactions they have with their family and other social contexts um, um, inform their, their experience. This is another slide kind of looking at the relationship between the drug um, biology um, affecting the in biology going back and forth with the environment also playing a role and then all of these factors together influencing brain mechanisms and their experience in addiction. So again, substance use disorder, including opiate use disorder is really a chronic condition and what's key to remember is that um, treatment and 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 um, some, some use the term recovery as possible and it's, it's this process of change. And usually, you know, we may not have, um, we may not know what a certain individual's goals are. So it's a really important thing to go in with our patient, into with our patients. Um, but, you know, usually it's going to be some aspect of improving quality of life and it may or may not include actual um, complete sobriety. So again, kind of reviewing this, um, that substance use disorder is chronic. Um, this is really a take home message here and has similar, you, you often compare it to other chronic disease processes such as diabetes, hypertension, and asthma because they have similar genetic impacts, thought to be about 50%. Um, and the contributions of environment um, and sort of the uh, lifestyle um, such as diet and exercise um, for diabetes um, um, are, are similar as well. Also adherence to taking medication and then relapse rates of symptoms associated with those different disease states are also similar. 
And we also see for all of these things that long-term, being on treatment long-term is really what's most effective and episodic treatment, um, or in the case of substance use disorder, just detox is not. This is kind of a nice slide showing that um, comparison. So here we have addiction to substance. Um, here we have uh, type one, in this case, diabetes, hypertension, asthma. And it really, this, this looked at patients experience of recurrence of symptoms requiring additional medical care for each of these conditions. And you can see the simil similarity here in those percentages. So it's, it's always important to consider how stigma plays a role in, um, in one's experience, and in this case, an experience of um, their substance use treatment and in recovery um, experience. So really, we know that individuals with substance use disorder, even you know, going back to that um, different sort of perspectives over time, um, that they still are perceived um, um, as having this sort of moral weakness or character flaws. And, and really it's important that we all ask ourselves if we've had these thoughts about, about patients. I know they come up um, in many ways and it's just important to kind of identify them as they, as they occur in order to address them both internally and in, in our interactions. Um, we know that medical professionals still view addiction negatively. So um, there was a, one study on these medical perspectives found that the respondents, the professionals um, who were surveyed said people with substance use disorders should actually not be as prioritized in healthcare because in, in attributing their condition to, to being a fault of, of theirs. Um, we also know in studies that that there's actual negative health outcomes because of provider views that that um, is actually a, a direct result of, of stigma in the healthcare system. Um, we also know that internalized stigma equals worse outcomes, right, for our patients. So how does this present? So, um, you know, that internalized stigma can make them less likely to, to stay in treatment, might feel like they have a sense of shame about, about getting their um, uh, condition uh, treated. Um, they may have worse mental and physical health, just overall having trouble kind of advocating for themselves. Um, decrease employment and housing, this often um, times will complicate any um, attempts or, or engagement in treatment. Um, and then they may have poor support systems because that stigma often exists in the family as well. And then there's this idea of learned helplessness, like why bother? So kind of already once an addict, always an addict. So um, feeling that there's really no point um, so we'll talk about sort of in general treatment recommendations now, and really with all chronic illnesses, again, treatment should be continuous um, rather than episodic and should focus on the whole person, not just their behavior. I think um, this is here about Rat Park. Do you all know what Rat Park is? I, I won't go into it in detail if you know. Okay. Um, or I don't know if I can go into detail, but what, what I think it's here because it was this experiment, I think several decades ago, like maybe in the 70s or 80s, if someone knows more, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, where they basically um, studied rats who were in different types of settings. So in one setting, the rat was alone in its cage and it had a um, bottle of water and then bottles that was laced with maybe cocaine or other drugs. And um, they found that the rats that had no social interaction. So again, the other cage was actually looking at um, rats that had like fun things to play with and other rats to like enjoy their time with. And that the rats in who were alone in their cage without other types of sort of interaction, whether with their environment um, or other um, animals um, were drinking from the, um, the, the, the bottle that um, contained the drugs um, much more, whereas that wasn't the case in the one where they had more social interaction. And it's actually a really fascinating thing. It's brought up a lot of kind of, I know, conversations over time sort of uh, about what the study means and how it represents um, humans. And, um, and it actually, I, I think though, in this sense, it does shed light on how important it is to kind of consider that it's not really just about the, the drugs, it's about the environment that people are in and how um, engaged and, and how we are engaging them really um, as people. Um, so I would encourage people to, to check out that. If you think if you just probably look up Rat Park, it'll, it'll come up right away. Um, and so treatment really needs to include a combination of different things to get at all aspects of the disease, right? So it's not just medication, but also learning new skills. And we'll talk about sort of some of the therapies that are um, recommended, um, but social support um, and really, um, 
you know, just like we would um, want to support, say, our patient with diabetes with nutritional support and maybe other um, um, case management, like if they're having trouble with their appointments, things like that, same idea would go for substance use disorder. So the goal um, should be improvement of the disease state, right? Not a cure um, because of that sort of remitting relapsing, excuse me, state. And we really wanna use evidence-based treatments that are going to lead to substantial improvement in the following areas. So reduction of use, again, we may not know by how much each person's goal may be, is, is going to be different. Um, increasing their personal health and social functioning, reducing threats to the, the public um, cost of, of disease, right? So to public health and safety and reducing the monetary cost for the individual and their community. So recovery really requires active work across all dimensions of wellness. So um, working with them on their physical health, their emotional health, stability of relationships is really key. And I often find that this is oftentimes a turning point in terms of how people are doing in their, in their disease um, state. Um, and then their stability, the comfort of their living environment, right? So this is kind of going back to that example from the study that I mentioned. Um, and then their positive community participation. We know that work um, brings a lot of purpose um, to one's life. And, um, and so this is oftentimes also very key in someone's experience of getting better. Um, and then of course, life meaning and purpose sort of as a larger um, concept. And just remembering this is a lifelong process. I think that it, um, it would be hard for any individual um, um, with a chronic disease, including substance use disorder or not, to, um, to really um, uh, achieve all of these goals um, quickly. So it's really lifelong for, for everybody. So what are some psychosocial interventions um, that, that work? And so first we're gonna talk about harm reduction versus abstinence models. Um, the abstinence model, which was like, you know, going cold turkey, um, which, uh, has been around for a long time, sort of assumes that abstinence is best and that it's the most effective way to, to treat. And the, the models that are well known for this are AA and 12-step, which has been around a long time and for many individuals can be very beneficial, um, um, despite not having as much um, you know, evidence for, for treatment. And then the Minnesota models is one that's well known. And then there's the harm reduction model or warm turkey instead of cold turkey, which is kind of more, more the current model. And the priority in this is, re is reducing harm, right? So placing harm reduction as a priority um, in, in many folds, social, health, economic, and again, it's it's in similar to those other chronic health issues, um, you know, can focus on um, relapse prevention skills. And it assumes that substance use disorder, you know, can be treated by gradually decreasing use over time, um, that people can be in treatment um, while they continue to use, so may not be abstinent. And medications are, are encouraged, and I would say we'll make the... the um, uh, uh, point the case here for how they should be central. Um, this is a slide which um, for motivational interviewing you, you've um, probably uh, seen this or a, a, a version of this. Um, but basically showing the stages of change, right? The patients need to be ready. Um, and so you can see across here, we've talked about pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, maintenance, relapse stage. Sometimes you'll see this as a cycle, right? I think in part, you can see the arrows <laughs> going different ways. Um, but you can see how you, different types of, of um, treatment come in depending on what stage your patient might be in, right? So like if they're in pre-contemplation, they're really not considering this to be a problem. We may just, you know, turning to our motivational enhancement strategies is, is going to be key. But for instance, if someone's here and it's really in the action stage and we want to be working with them on some more like actual relapse prevention skills and helping them manage any, any lapses when they come. So the patient's... Um, what, what would be considered ineffective and not recommended model uh, intervention, sorry, like detox alone, not recommended, uh, very, very high rates of relapse. Individual psychodynamic and psychoanalytic therapy only um, is not recommended and unstructured sort of supportive individual therapy only is not recommended. So you can notice the only here that in combination with other therapies um, may be useful. Um, sort of unstructured um, group therapy not recommended. Um, definitely don't wanna discharge people from treatment um, as a response to ongoing use. 
confrontational approaches we know don't usually work. Um, <laughs> um, acupuncture um, alone is not recommended. Um, I know that there's ongoing research about acupuncture, um, and I, I think that certainly along with other modalities, um, it can be quite quite useful. Relax ther relaxation therapy alone, not recommended, and just biological or like urine tox screen monitoring um, only is not recommended. So this is sort of the do not do on your on 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 their own. Um, not not effective. So what are some evidence based interventions? So we give a thumbs up again for motivational um, interviewing um, and then that enhancement therapy, um, whether individual or group cognitive behavioral therapy, lots of evidence behind this therapy approach um, for um, opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, um, different um, um, different conditions for sure. Um, and this really has this harm reduction approach and really relapse prevention development of techniques and skills to help with that. Um, contingency management has got quite a bit of, of um, evidence, especially in combination with community reinforcement approach. Um, so basically contingency management um, it's also been shown to be uh, quite effective for um, stimulant use disorder, which we're not really going into in this talk, but um, but can be used for other substance use disorders as well. And it's really um, offering sort of a motivational incentive. So an example would be like um, points um, over time that might go towards like a bus voucher um, for negative urine tox screen. So some sort of actual like um, more tangible kind of um, incentive um, that combined with the community reinforcement individual group um, trying to meet the patient where they're at that has been shown to be quite helpful. And then we have 12 step peer support um, that um, has some evidence, especially when used with um, other modalities. Um, and then structured family um, therapy has been shown to really be the um, primary intervention for our adolescent population. So I'm going to move on in the last few minutes to medication assisted interventions. Um, this first talk is a little little lengthy, so I hope to wrap up before too long and we can have a more of a conversation. Um, so what are FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder? So there are three, well actually four when you can count the different forms. Methadone um, is our agonist, and we'll um, talk more about that specifically, but gives um, the full stimulation at the mu receptor. Buprenorphine, um, which comes in different forms, um, sublingual, injectable, um, is our partial agonist, right? So causes that kind of sealing effect, which is um, the reason for its safety. And buprenorphine here um, is um, listed as monoproduct, but it also comes as a more well, well known and more used um, 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 buprenorphine with naloxone product. And then naltrexone, which is our antagonist at the mu receptor, also approved for alcohol use disorder. Um, oral form, not effective for opioid use disorder, but it does have evidence for alcohol. And then the injectable form um, does have some evidence for opioid use disorder. And buprenorphine, again, this is the, the main reason why we're, we're doing this. Um, this was approved in the um, Drug Abuse Treatment Act boy, now over 20 years ago, um, which this really was key in, in making treatment possible in the outpatient setting um, beyond sort of uh, methadone clinics. In 2002 is when we got the FDA approval to um, prescribe the sublingual form for treatment of opioid use disorder as a schedule three. Um, physicians are required to have the eight hour um, training to get the X number. Um, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, CNMs um, have the uh, additional um, 16 hours, so a total of 24 hour. Um, and we can prescribe up to 30 patients, so active prescriptions at one time is what that means in the first year, um, and then can apply to, for uh, 100 and then up to 275. So there are significant treatment barriers. Um, so the, the barriers span many things. We, we know that a large um, amount, 77% of state US of the US has unmet behavioral health and addiction um, needs. Um, and only 2.5 million received treatment in 2013 out of 22 million who needed it. So there's lots of reasons for this that have been looked at. Um, and this comes, I think, from um, the uh, 
SAMHSA um, and the survey, NSDA surveys um, have, have found different reasons. So there's a lack of mental health providers in general. Um, there's an even greater lack who have substance use disorder specialty training. There's a stigma that you know, raises its head again in, in substance use. Um, I don't work with those people. And then there's limited understanding of um, those evidence-based models um, that we were talking about um, and sort of the siloization of the field. So um, it's either like abstinence versus harm reduction. And then there's high burnout and low compensation. So those are some of the reasons that have, were, were found. Um, and SAMHSA has the strategic plan to um, disseminate, develop more training and education for, for these sort of core addiction treatment competencies, increase the number of peer support, and develop ways to track the workforce and fund workforce needs. So there's still a lot of work to be done here. What are some treatment barriers to methadone? Uh, methadone is you know, out of medical mainstream, so patients for opioid use disorder must receive it at a federally um, uh, federally qualified, I was going to say FQHC, nope, um, <laughs> at an opiate treatment program or a methadone clinic. Um, and, you know, these are oftentimes located really far away. They, they actually are planned to be sort of out of the center of town. And there's stigma associated with going to a specialty addiction clinic. They oftentimes, COVID has made this different, but require daily dosing um, for, for a long time before starting to get take homes. So a lot of federal regulations that um, in some ways um, definitely help with the safety, um, but certainly can present barriers to people. So the benefits of office-based treatment, you know, for um, patients who are on buprenorphine is that it's private, confidential, they can go to their um, provider's office and, um, you know, check in at the front desk for their hypertension, but also be getting treatment for their opioid use disorder. Um, and then a, this continuity of care, I can't stress how important I think that is um, for, for people and for providers, just in terms of the gratification of practice too. Um, it doesn't require the daily visits um, and usually the clinics are more conveniently located. And so this can allow for more time for, for work and family and all those other things that we talked about as being key to someone's um, well-being. There is a lack of availability. The good news is that nationally, and this I think is thanks to that Kara Act of 2016, which was key in getting um, waiver, um, waiver uh, providers among our PAs and MPs, um, but the, the, the number of waiver providers increased by 175% between 2016 and 2018, and this really increased um, capacity. Um, the concerns are that still many U.S. counties don't have a waiver provider. The number is as high as 57%, at least in this last um, assessment in rural um, areas. 20 million individuals live in counties with no provider, and again, 70% of those are in rural counties. So um, you can see a big, a big um, disparity here when you're looking at this, like, wow, between the metropolitan and rural providers. Um, and there's been a shift, certainly an increase, but we, we definitely still need, need more. Um, this map, I believe, was 2016 data, I think, um, that looks at U.S. counties with providers with a DEA waiver. Um, you can see the blue has both a physician, um, a nurse practitioner, and PA. Um, green has a physician provider only, and red um, has a uh, nurse practitioner, physician assistant only, and then this sort of swath in the middle of the country with white had no buprenorphine providers. Um, New Mexico, yay, doing pretty well. Always can always do more, but <laughs> so there's a lot of factors here that may influence. Um, MOUD again is a medication for opioid use disorder. These were themes that were found. This is a pretty wordy slide. I'm not going to read through it all, but you can kind of scan through it. And these were some of these themes that you may, some may be like, yeah, that is a that is an issue for sure. Um, that may affect someone's, um, you know, um, being. Um, of, of able to provide this this treatment and a lot of them sometimes have to do with like just getting started and finding like you have the support um, but some of it has to do with perceptions of like all the requirements that um, that may exist and I think that um, a lot of it um, does sort of a lot of these concerns once people start doing it um, definitely lessen but at the forefront these can certainly play a role and then down here you know overcoming stigma that that, that again is is definitely a, a big 
a big one, I think, for many of us. Um, providers too sometimes, you know, experience um, some stigma working in this field, and it's important to acknowledge that too. But certainly for our patients. Oh, I guess that was the last. That was the last slide. So good. I'll stop talking. 